Hi there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to yet another cracking installment of the Map Round Show. This is the Built in California series where I'm shining a light on some awesome talent uh, and entrepreneurs just basically doing rad stuff and change, solving real problems that matter to people. Uh, this is going to be a great story. Uh, with, uh, with us today is Clint Connell. He is the CEO of Inbrace. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate you having us. Uh, anytime, man. The privilege is really all mine. So um, I've had the privilege of really getting to know exactly what you guys are doing uh, from, a, from a health perspective and from a social perspective. And we'll get into the meat and the potatoes around that. But for our viewers and uh, audience around the world, Clint, that haven't heard about Embrace and, and, and you know maybe want to kind of you know learn a bit more of, from like the origin story, uh, give us the background, give us the elevator pitch and what do we need to know? Yeah, no, thanks, Matt. Um, listen, it's pretty simple to understand. Most people um, have crooked teeth at some point in their life, and uh, the current options out there are braces and aligners. And uh, braces work, but they're terribly embarrassing. So the only person who likes them is your orthodontist or your dentist, as you look across the globe. Um, and it, and 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 the other option is aligners. And Invisalign has done a wonderful job creating an amazing company. But the only thing aligners really do is uh, make it less embarrassing. Um, but what most people don't know is you need to wear aligners 20 to 22 hours a day. And so you really give up a lot of your lifestyle. You can't eat, drink, brush, floss your teeth. And what Embrace has developed is, is quite extraordinary and very disruptive. Uh, we're braces behind the teeth. And so you literally can't see them. We work like braces, but about 30% faster than traditional braces. And um, they work all the time, but you can brush, you can floss, you can drink and eat normally. And uh, we call it wow starts now. And uh, it's really, um, to me, a very exciting and disruptive technology uh, in one of the largest markets in the world. There's a lot of us out there with teeth. Most of them are crooked. So that's our, that's our mission is to make it the choice in teeth straightening. Right. Now, this isn't your first uh, rodeo, uh, Clint. What's your, what's your founder story? Yeah, so I came out of a university and um, I went to a school probably I was I was probably not qualified for, but I chased the soccer ball pretty well. Um, and when I came out, uh, my father had been a small business person. I didn't know what bankers were. I thought it was that's where he sent the checks and money came out of the tube. And um, I didn't know if I wanted to be a doctor, so I thought I'd be a, a lawyer. But I said, let's go work for a little while. So I started through Johnson and Johnson and healthcare, uh, Chiron Vision. I uh, hadn't learned finance, so I took a little detour and learned finance. I uh, got an M&A job in dialysis, and my first business I started was at 29. I started my own dialysis centers, later sold those back to the company I'd left in 05, and that sent me really on an entrepreneur's journey where um, I helped take Sultan Medical Public in 06, which is now a global brand owned by Bausch, ironically. Um, Hydrofacial, I just finished running, which we took from a $100 million equity check to about a $4.5 billion market cap at its height. And uh, I currently have a, a business also where I'm chairman called Orange Twist, which is a chain of medical spas. There's 15 of them that is, uh, is quite exciting. And just last week, uh, a team launched a business called Geneo, um, which is a, a complimentary business in the Medispa space. And uh, my day job is Embrace, um, which is a super compelling, uh, intellectually challenging and enormous idea. So it's been a, a, tortured, uh, a tortured path as many entrepreneurs have. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> so, uh, Clint, what what appeals to you about this? Like, you know, why did you, uh, you know, what 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 is this thing about Embrace specifically as a founder, multiple time founder? You've obviously achieved like a lot of success. What is it about this particular business, this particular uh, company that you know really resonates with you as a founder? Yeah, well, I joined originally as a board member, and I was called by somebody who'd, who'd worked with me over the years and was an investor and said, look, we've got this unbelievable technology. We've got this brilliant founder, and all of us are finance guys. He needs some help. He needs, he needs one of you that can speak both of our languages. So Dr. John Pham was the CEO at the time. He's still our founder and chief medical officer and a wonderful man. And what drew me to this um, was quite compelling. One is John is, a, is an immigrant. He's Vietnamese. Um, he went to school and became an orthodontist and, excuse me, became an engineer, an aerospace engineer for Boeing. Uh, his mom tapped him on the shoulder like many moms of Vietnamese uh, culture and said, look, I, you know, Vietnamese mother wants a Vietnamese uh, son to be a doctor. And so he went back and actually became an orthodontist. And he was doing his uh, residency at, uh, at USC and he was working on the most difficult cases. Uh, the the 
uh, cleft lip and palate children, kids that have massive deformities around the mouth. What a lot, a lot of people don't know, they're very young, they get 20, 30 surgeries sometimes, and uh, they always have, almost always have crooked teeth, very disfigured teeth. And so you can't do surgery on them. I mean, they've done a lot of surgery, you can't put braces on them. And so John came up with his engineering orthodontist background, a clever idea to put braces behind the teeth and uh, nobody given him any money. So he actually went to the USC engineering group who actually originally seed funded this. So it's been roughly 10 years, which as you know, overnight success, success takes about 10 years, but that was uh, John's journey. And uh, I fell in love with him. I fell in love with the idea. And so we decided to put our, uh, our talents to work and do this together. Fantastic. Well, congratulations on all your success. I know you guys have just uh, closed the Series D round, so it's clearly going in the right direction. And I think, you know, this problem, I mean, I had, uh, I didn't have like the proper, you know, like hectic braces, you know, like where they yeah. all over your mouth and what have you. <laughs> but I did, <laughs> I'm a, I did actually have a bottom plate. And I used to, I remember as a child, I was probably like eight or nine, and I would go to school um, and I had this brace thing in here, but I'd have to have my lunch. My mom would make me like sandwiches and what have you. So then I would take out this like this plate essentially uh, that had was molded and what have you. And then invariably I would lose it. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was just like a real, it was a real, my mom used to like my dad, especially as he was a, a very disciplined man. Let's just put it that yes. way. Um, and you know, that generation and what have you. And yo, I got into so much trouble for losing my, my braces and so forth. But I was always great, grateful that I didn't have this social problem, you know, like the yeah. stigma around, like, I don't want to open up my yap or smile at anybody. Cause I've got this grotesque, ugly, you know, I call it ugly. Uh, yeah. But it's it's like a, it's a thing. It's like it's oh my god! It's like it's you know you don't kiss a girl with, with yeah. this metal on her teeth. You know what I mean? Like it's a social stigma yeah. thing. So I'm curious to get your yeah, it's terrible and and it is challenging. And so um, I'd love to get your your view, Clint. Like, what's the problem here? I mean, I get like it's the street. It's a, a it's a brace, right? I get it in brace, yeah. um, and it's a way better brace. Yeah. It's way more innovative and so forth. But what problem over and above? the straightening of teeth is this actually solving yeah so think about it. You're, you're walking through something that only you know millions and millions of consumers in fact there's about 21 million uh, starts a year for consumers around the world to straighten their teeth and 88 percent of those are still braces you know and you were lucky to just have the kind of the the bracket on the bottom right um think about that we tell people to advertise somewhere between two and four years the problem they have before we make them better so both of my children had braces and um, they were expensive, they were painful, they were embarrassing. Um, and for two, two and a half years, they had to advertise their problem to the world before they actually unveiled and had this great smile. That is friggin' insane when you think about it. Um, when you think about what Invisalign did, I mean, Invisalign one time had a $50 billion market cap and essentially it's a, you know, it's a mouth guard, right? That you pretend you can't see, but everybody can see it, but you really can't live your normal life. So you've got to do that for a couple of years. And what Embrace allows you to do is live your life the minute you get your teeth straight. And I think people underestimate the, the social impact, you know, the, 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 you know, the way it weighs on people's confidence, particularly during their developmental years. Um, the last thing that I would say is the nature of our technology, which we'll get into, makes the predictability of outcomes driven by software, programming hardware, and using AI. So I actually think we can improve dental care across the world where the standards aren't always the same as we have here uh, in the United States. So, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a big problem and we have a big solution, just a lot of hard work in between. Mm -hmm. uh, so Clint, let's talk about this, the actual product. So I've got it up on, uh, on screen for everybody, but it's super, oh. super thin. I was actually quite um, surprised at exactly how, uh, how tiny it is. And it's like, you can take it in and out, you can eat normally, helps with the confidence stuff that you touched on earlier. Um, and, and from my understanding, it sits actually behind the teeth, right. uh, which is a truly novel uh, design. So I'd love for you to just, uh, you know, double click on that for, for our audience around the world, like from an innovation and a product perspective, like how does it actually all come together? Yeah, it's, it's quite magical, uh, Matt. I'm not an engineer, um, but I tend to be an early adopter white space guy. When I first saw this, I mean, it, it really was hard to wrap my head around. Um, you go into your orthodontist and you get a scan and there's a variety of scanners out there and they, they take a picture of where your teeth are now in 3D 
And then the software, which has developed over the last decade, um, simulates what your teeth will need to do to move to have a great smile. Uh, we call that an embrace toothprint. It's unique and specific to you. Then here's where it gets crazy. That software algorithm is sent back to our engineers and we develop a treatment plan. Um, that treatment plan is approved by your orthodontist. And then we program a piece of nitinol technology um, to move your teeth um, exactly the way they need to over a six, nine, 12 month period uh, to have a, a beautiful smile. Um, and when you when we program the technology about 10 to 14 days later, you come in and we do a fitting. The fitting takes roughly 30 to 45 minutes. Um, the brackets hold it in place and the wire starts work moving um, immediately. But the, the results are astonishing. And, and the best thing is nobody knows you're having it done at the time. Nitinol is a technology that was actually used um, to send satellites up into orbit. And um, the way they do that, if you think about this, the satellite, the, the satellites are in a ball. They're put at the cone of a, of a rocket. And when they reach atmospheric heat, um, they expand and go back to their original uh, their original shape. And so that's the heritage of the technology. And that combines John's aerospace engineering background uh, with, uh, with, with the ability to program these for teeth. It's quite unique. So unpack that for us. So what's the name of that technology again, the actual metal? Yeah, nitinol. And so it actually comes in like a straight line. I mean, you would think, well, you know, is this something, some kind of piece of electrical wire? Um, but where, where it's um, unique is the way that we manufacture it, the way that we program it, and then the way that we, we insert it for predictable outcomes. Um, we call it a smart wire, and it's smart because literally we use software to program the wire to move your teeth in any, any one of six directions to a perfect place. So if you have gaps, rotations, lower, higher, we literally move the entire uh, 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 teeth in the mouth to a position they, that, that creates a great smile. Yeah, but how? Like, how's that? How's that actually possible? I've never heard of something called a smart wire or yeah. any kind of smart metal. Like, that's yeah. is it from like aer aerospace? Like, super high tech, man. I mean, I know we're a medical device company technically, yeah. you know, and we're the orthodontic business, um, but we have you know roughly twenty five software programmers, and they're programming the treatment algorithm up front. They're actually building and programming our robots to automate the technology. Um, and then once what we call an appliance, once the device is actually in your mouth, we're actually getting feedback on how that's moving. A typical case takes two wires. So once we, once we bond or fit your Embrace uh, technology, it moves the teeth very predictably. And about eight to 12 weeks in, you put your second wire on, on a trip to your orthodontist. Um, it's a little, and it sounds like a crazy exaggeration, but it's a little Tesla-like in that we are doing something in a predictable pattern for software that's driven through hardware. So if you think about Tesla, it's not really a, it, it is a car, but it's really the software that's driving it. Our technology works in a very similar fashion. Um, so that's that's truly remarkable. So I think I'm quite curious. I've spoken to um, a, a few med tech uh, founders over the last month or so, and one of them uh, is uh, Guillermo Ramas. He's uh, the CEO of Notosphere, doing some cool thing or things around medical recalls. And one of the things he was telling me was, um, was that you know in the medical fraternity because they've been doing things the same way for so long, he's finding it quite difficult to get them to adopt change. Yes. So they 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 like the idea of change. They believe they can, but when it actually like normal stuff, right? Like I don't I actually don't like. You know, yeah. <laughs> otherwise, we'd all have six packs, wouldn't we, Clint? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. So so what's the I mean. How, what's the initial sort of response been like from yeah. from uh, orthodontists, um, and how do, how do you see the change? I mean, obviously yeah. this is a global problem, right? I mean, like, yeah. how do you see this change, this desired behavior change, playing out over the next six to twelve months and beyond? Yeah, it's great. It's great insight, uh, Matt, and I agree with your friend with Guillermo. Um, our NPS scores, you know, how much people like it. So most healthcare treatments, you may be aware, of, or procedures the NPS score is negative. Um, dental NPS scores, how much you like a dental treatment is actually a score of one. And our consumer surveys show that we're an 85 to an 87 in our NPS scores, just off the charts. So we've got the consumer. I also joke that I win all the cocktail party pitches. You know, if you sit down with 10 people, everybody's drinking some wine or having a coffee chat, 
and you say, they say, what are you doing, Clint? And I say, look, here's what Embrace is. You know braces, you know aligners. Everybody has a bad experience with them. I say, here's what we do. Everybody, everybody's signing up or signing their kids up. So we win the cocktail party pitch. Um, we win once it's done, uh, but changing a specialty is very difficult, right? Um, it's the old, you know, all the world is a, what is it? All the world is a, a nail because I have a hammer. I'm mm -hmm. sure I, I botched that. No, um, but that's what we're in the process of doing right now is teaching orthodontists, hey, uh, you can delegate this to your staff. Um, we'll work with you to program the treatment, but this is really on autopilot. So if you think of, if you talk to early Tesla drivers, getting used to autopilot is sort of spooky because you're always used to having your, your hands on the steering wheel and on the pedal. Um, once you get used to it, you realize you can't go backwards. I mean, I have a 100% EV here. I can't go backwards. Mm. But we got to get people in that car. In our case, we got to get them to do embrace. We got to get them to let the teeth move with this magical smart wire. Uh, and we have to have them adopt that in their practice. So that's what we're doing right now. And, um, you know, it always goes slower than the CEO wants. Um, but I believe that this is the future of, uh, of smile improvement. So to me, it's, it's a journey worth taking. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, I mean, do you, when it comes to this intermediary channel, I mean, I find it, it, it exists in the technology space. You have big, you know, OEMs, Microsoft, Oracle, SAP, yep. distribution companies, resellers, things like that. This, uh, the growth opportunity, the the exponential growth opportunity in many cases is actually driven through this intermediary yep. channel, if you like. In your case, it would be orthodontist. So, yes, um, you know, consumers obviously benefit from that, uh, but you know, they're going to their dentist and going, "Hey, I saw this thing called Embrace," you know. I want that for my child's teeth or my son's teeth or what have you. Yeah. So that intermediary channel is like really, really important. Yeah. Um, and, and it, you know, and, and it's there because of a number of reasons, but when it, from an entrepreneur's perspective, a CEO's perspective, when one's looking to scale, like there's a reason why Microsoft doesn't want to deal with, you know, 10 million small businesses. They want someone else to do it. Right. So you're yeah. almost going like B to B to C. So yeah. when you're in a B to B to C uh, model, um, yeah. What have you learned about being successful yeah. in that kind of go-to-market space? Yeah, um, that is such a great question, Matt, and, and shows you're an entrepreneur and you've got an audience full of them. Um, I, I told a good friend of mine after Hydrofacial was very successful, and he's a he's a successful um, investor, and he was so proud of me and congratulating me over dinner, and I, I, I said some stuff you'd probably have to bleep out. And, it's something along the lines of, I don't even like you anymore because anybody who's an entrepreneur out there knows that by the time you're successful, you can't stand all your friends and family because you know secretly they were saying you were crazy mm -hmm. and that you'd never be successful. So I think two, you know, one is um, every time I look to apply my time, my money or, or my talent and sacrifice other things, I think you've got to have a big idea. It's just as hard to go after a big idea as a small idea. Um, and then you have to be super comfortable being out there on the, what I call the thin branches, a little crazy, because nobody believes you if the idea is big enough and far enough out there. So by your very nature, you are, you know, you're an outcast by all the normal people around you. Um, you have to be very, very crisp about what you're looking to accomplish. And then you need to start getting your first followers and, and you need to execute, right? You can't just have a dream without, without the deadlines. Uh, and executional things needed, but um, I think start with the start with a big idea in a big market. Feel comfortable with your vision. Hire great people, and then just go to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's no substitute for going to work. And every successful entrepreneur, I've known very few that have been able to shortcut that process. Um, and it's flipping lonely, but it's to me it's incredibly rewarding because I just can't imagine doing things that other people have done before. Mm -hmm. um, and or trying to copy by pricing or I mean I just that's just not my jam. I like the white space. I like things that people haven't done before. Yeah. I was speaking to uh, Billy Brash. He's also out in uh, Palo Alto. And uh, I asked him, I was like, you know, um, what role has being in Silicon Valley or in California, you know, uh, played in your success? And he was like, dude, like if you go to like a, a, a VC in, uh, or an investor in Silicon Valley or in California and you go, hey, Here's my here's my vision. I believe I can change the world. And even doesn't matter like how crazy it is, you're far more likely to be believed. Like someone will go, yes, like I get it. Like I, I think you're gonna get there. Yeah. And to, your, and to your point around the white space, 
I also asked him that. I said, you know, how important is it to have a white space? He was like, dude, like it's essential. Yeah. Um, and uh, like what you've done is like you've created an entirely new category, right, for yep. for healthcare. Yeah. Um, and it's it's really really amazing the white space that uh, that you've been in or that you've created. Um, so on this uh, idea of this white space, this category king idea or this category queen idea, um, how have you seen? the fact that you have innovated and you're changing such an important problem for so many people. Like I know one of the stats I know here is like there's 330 million teenagers in the U S and only 5% get treatment for stuff like this. I mean, like that's huge, right? So, so in the white, if you take this white space idea that you guys have as embrace, um, what, how do you see that playing out right across like the set, like the 95% of underserved, you know, teenagers in the, in the U S so to speak. It's a little provocative. I, I told employees during my first all hands, you know, the first slide, and now I use it every all hands. Um, if we do our jobs right, um, braces and aligners will cease to exist. Hmm. And, you know, you could have heard pin drop um, because I think the company has an incredible technology, um, but sometimes it's easy to be shy about what you're really looking to accomplish. If we really believe we have a better option, we work like braces, we get you there faster without the embarrassment, you don't have to compromise your life, that's worthy. I mean, there are tens of millions of adults and teenagers that can benefit from that. Um, that's pretty audacious. You know, I, some of my team was like, hey, don't upset the braces companies and the orthodontists and the, you know, don't upset the aligner companies and, and the dentists. And I, I don't think that's appropriate. I'm not upsetting them. They are going to innovate and they're going to do well and those executives will do well. Um, but we have to sign up to say that our mission is worthy. And it's, it's very similar to Kennedy's famous, right? By the end of this decade, we'll put a man on the moon. And they didn't even have spacesuits that could tolerate. They didn't know if they could build rockets to get us there. Um, I guess if you're a conspiracy theorist, we never were, but we're about ready to figure it out again. But um, to me, that's just super cool. Musk just did it right. He said, look, I'm selling all my possessions because I'm trying to save the earth. And if that doesn't work out, I got to find a way to colonize Mars. That's pretty crazy. But if you think about what they're doing with SpaceX and Tesla and the solar city panels now that are under Tesla, that's what they're doing. Um, I'm sure there's tons of smart people working for that entrepreneur, but that is the CEO of the entrepreneur's job is to go out there and stake, you know, stake what you're going to do and believe in. I think you then have to sequence it. I mean, I'm a big fan of the master plan. Our master plan and very rough speak is making predictable and profitable outcomes for the provider. Cause if they can't make money and it doesn't work, they're not going to adopt it. Mm. Secondly is we have to pierce through the noise. So the consumer knows how much better our mousetrap is. Um, our mass customization has to be fast, effective, and high quality. And then we need to export this outside the US. And if we do that, I think we will be the choice uh, for teeth improvement. And I think that's worthy. That's super fun. I wish I would have known it before my kids went through it, but you know, maybe grandkids will get a chance to benefit from this technology. Yeah, exactly. It's so interesting that what you said there on like, well, it's probable that, you know, because of your product, you're literally going to make everything that came before it completely obsolete to such a degree that it won't exist. That's quite an amazing uh, opportunity. No, it's crazy, right? I mean, there's there's over 21 million starts globally. That's a very large market. Those starts, I mean, it could, the average braces or liners case like $6,500, $7,000. That's a big market. And, um, and I think there's a bigger market. I, thought, I think a lot of people don't get braces and don't get aligners because they already know what the negative benefits are um, or they don't have access to the care. So we're not there yet. You know, it's every Disney story, every Steve Jobs speak is take you out to the future, then the dark music cues and you got a lot of work to do. So I don't want to overplay where Embrace is, um, but this technology I think is going to uh, be highly, highly uh, disruptive in a very positive way because I think we have what the consumer wants. So now mm -hmm. we make sure our providers are our friends and allies in, in this in this quest to your point uh clint you you just said like you know a lot of people need this consumers and then you've got this channel orthodontists that uh are incentivized also to change the way that they create you know um, positive outcomes for their patients um, and then, then you've got the white space, you've got series D capital behind you. It's like, damn, like you're in the stage where you're like, you like the Elon Musk SpaceX idea, right? Like you at this rocket ship, that's literally going to cross the chasm, get that early majority to adopt and what have you. And so this is really for you. It's like, how quickly can you scale here? And so, what I, sorry, yeah, no, go ahead. You want to say something? 
No, you're right. This is go timing. If you raise a quarter billion dollars for a med device company at this stage, you better be successful. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of people. I, I mean, when people are like, hey, congratulations, you know, I, I, I feel a bit of um, you know, claustrophobia because I've got a lot of super smart people um, that have invested in this company and we need to make sure that their investment was, was in the right place with the right people. So how do you scale responsibly? You know what I mean? Like I think there's, a, if, you, if you think about Adam Newman and WeWork, and yeah. what he did, like, it was super questionable, even though Mark Andreessen's not backed yeah. him again. <laughs> I yeah. mean, like, yeah. come on, man. Like, Crazy. why are we such, that's ridiculous, right? Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but uh, like, it's about scaling responsibly, you know, um, yeah. and finding the right, putting the right structures and team in place so that you can achieve that uh, scale for your, and yeah. ultimately the returns for your investors. What have you learned? I mean, it's not your first rodeo, so you've done this before. Yeah. Um, but um, what have you learned about scaling responsibly quickly but yeah. responsibly and it's one of the hardest things um you know there's a couple of great books out there about blitz scaling and uh i think that's a great read um and it teaches you that you got to go fast you'll always have a little brush fires you got to figure out which ones are, are real um for me i use a process called strategic learning process i'm at if this is helpful and to me it's just normal speak because i'm i'm not uh, educated in any of the the technical uh, occupations you start with where your current business is. And for me, I usually choose say a three year time. Where do we want to take the business? What does the future state of this look like? And you need to do just a gap analysis, right? Um, from that, you say, okay, we got a lot of things we got to do. You've got to then force prioritize your plans of action. Um, that's the next phase. And then the hardest part what you're talking about is how do you align your people, your processes, your programs and your incentives um, to accomplish these plans of action and then this a lot of people go straight to budget this is when you start to budget and then you set out your operating plan then you set up your measurement and if you could do that on a constant basis i think it allows your organization to constantly be doing creative destruction because i've seen a lot of companies with an abundance of riches like we've had the amount of money we've raised and they just hire a ton of people and then you see the office space empty three years from now and so i don't think throwing people or money at any problem is the best way um, and so I tend to be a little bit more judicious about how you add people because people, when they get hired, they want to hire other people and they want to spend money. Mm -hmm. So the trick is always hiring them soon enough. Right. Um, but also being super conscious of the fact that you want to be um, very thrifty with investors capital because you can't get back time. You can always raise more money, but it's easier to raise more money when you've done good stuff with the money they gave you the first time. I see a lot of entrepreneurs make that mistake. Yeah, exactly. And just on the capital thing, um, do you see, I mean, obviously you've raised ma money more than once, but do you see capitals being equal? Like, um, you know, t 10 bar is the same or 10 million is the same as 10 million from the next guy, the next guy, the next guy. Or when you're raising a, like a special series BCD, do you, I know some of it comes from your existing series A and maybe even your angel investors, what have you, but do you see um, capitals being equal? And if not, what should be, what should uh, startup founders uh, looking to raise uh, money to scale be looking at over and above yeah. the capital itself? Man, uh, two parts to that. It's probably the most valuable lesson I've learned as, a, as an entrepreneur. I'm a young old guy. I'll turn 53 at the end of this month, but I've been doing it a while. Um, when I first started raising money, I was so excited to give my pitch and so excited to tell them how amazing I was in the company um, that I made a lot of mistakes. Um, so now, um, you know, because nobody shows up with less than a billion dollar idea. I've never seen a pitch deck with less than a billion dollar idea, but there's not that many unicorns. So they, these investors see all these pitch decks and we all sound the same. So one of the most important questions I think uh, you can ask when you're raising money, regardless of where the capital is, is, hey, Matt Brown Ventures, um, can you tell me a little about yourself, your fund and investments that you like and ones that you don't like? Because it's probably going to tell you right away whether you're a good fit. Um, it's also going to help shape the conversation and the pitch um, for things that are maybe important to, to Matt Brown as he makes that decision. Um, often asking what's a win look like for you because investors at different stages have different views of what a win is. I've, I've, I'm an angel. I've raised from angels. I've raised from private equity. I've taken to public uh, and I've done venture capital. They all have very different criteria uh, of what success looks like. So I think understanding what a win is is super important. Um, from day one. And um, is all the capital equal? Um, it's just different. You know, I mean, my last company, it was owned by the founders. I did the private equity diligence. We bought it. 
Um, we were going to be traded to another private equity firm and the world stopped spinning in Q1 of 2020. Uh, we flattened, we had to rebuild and we got bought through a SPAC and then we went public and it was a tremendous ride. Um, and so there were three different capital structures within, you know, an 18 month or a 24 month period um, and all had different objectives. And um, that's, just, I, I find that people get stuck in it. You've got to understand what the objective of the capital is because you may not want it. Uh, and if they don't think, and you can't take the capital and do something different because they're going to be upset with you. So I think aligning and understand what a win is and how they expect to be communicated, the challenges and, and the success of business is super important. It's a great point, right? Because context is literally, I think, probably the most overlooked word <laughs> when yes. it comes to like raising, like just in general, like when you talk about like startups, what kind of startup? Where are you? Are you pre-seed, seed, seed rev, yeah. pre gen revenue generating or not? Yeah. Are you in growth? Are you series A, B, C? And so yeah. like, you know, like the, the it's literally worlds apart depending on where you are uh, yeah. in, in the life cycle. And what you're saying is, uh, is it's the same thing for investors. Like if angels are different to like, you know, guys who are in, sitting in a PE or with a PE fund, you know what I mean? It's super weird too. I think I was reading a stat the other day and I think even a pitch book had it, which I'm sure you, you're, a lot yeah. of your listeners get. I think it was something about the speed to raise capital and the valuations for people that have been successful is incredible, right? And so when you're a first time entrepreneur, you're gonna have to lock, you know, knock on a lot of doors. Even the ones that are super successful that we read are unicorns and they dropped out of college. You know, there were thousands of phone calls and meetings before they found that one investor. Um, the more successful you are and the better you are to your investors, the easier it is to raise the next group. Um, and so, you know, now at this stage of my career, I'm turning down more opportunities for capital to go to work um, than I am out there asking for it. Um, so I would encourage listeners to, you know, treat capital preciously, listen to your investors, uh, don't bullshit them, you know, be straight up. I mean, we just had a, a board meeting for one of the companies and we had some challenging news and we had a lot of good things we did but I buried that in the appendix. And uh, we went through challenges where, what we were doing about them, when they would find the progress, things we didn't know that we'd give them more information on, probably more compliments than I've had from a board meeting in a long time. Uh, and the board member, one of them said, hey, very, very critical board member said, hey, you know what I like about that? I don't wanna run the company. I just don't wanna have to go digging around for what's really going on and feeling like I have to step in. So transparency, shooting straight, delivering upon your promises, super critical and i think we lose that in kind of all the consulting type of baloney and business books you know just um you know deliver on what you promise and don't promise if you can't deliver that's a pretty simple pretty simple way to think about it yeah under promise over deliver which is exactly what embrace is doing weirdly enough yeah yeah <laughs> we've got a lot of work to do right i think uh, in fact in this last one we had a couple of hiccups and I think that we didn't raise the um, the level of challenge on a couple of particular technical items to the board. Mm -hmm. And so they were looking like, hey, how come that's a problem? Once we told them what the problem was and the fix was in, they're like, oh, okay, that's okay. You can feel the literally the anxiety go down. I always tell new executives and new CEOs, remember, everybody has a boss. Somebody's working for the man. And um, a lot of times we don't realize as entrepreneurs that all of those investors have an investment committee. There's a founder of that fund. Maybe there's LPs behind it. And, if that person made a bad decision on Clint Carnell or Matt Brown, they might be losing their job. Mm. So that doesn't always come across that way when they're, you know, when they're spitting at you across the boardroom or on the phone, but, you know, ask them what's important to them. What's a win look like? And, um, and a lot of times they'll tell you. So one of the, I had a Steve Blank, uh, I'm sure you know him. Um, I had Steve Blank and David uh, Schoenthal on the show a couple nights ago. Um, and, uh, uh, David was t t basically, uh, it was like Stanford research or something. And they'd done research into like, you know, in the current macroeconomic climate, venture capital, what's up. Um, and one of the interesting things, which he said, he couldn't believe like it came up on the slide. Like it was one of the key points was venture capitalists are now looking for profit, uh, not valuations. So historically it was all like how much valuation can we drive? Yeah. Um, so that I can get the biggest exit possible. Yeah. Um, but now it's all about like profit, right? So, which is complete, it's like, it's ironic. It should have been the other way around. Do you know, like profit first, then valuation later. Uh, but now it seems to have flipped on its, uh, on its head somewhat. Yeah, look, we're all knuckleheads, right? And I probably have other words for us. I'm an investor, you're an investor, a lot of, so I'm, I'll insult all of us equally here is we all tend to be very, um, 
you know, crowd driven, right? And uh, if you look at some of the great investors of the world, the classic Warren Buffett's, a lot of times they're contrarians. I mean, I love Kessler's, um, uh, Andy Kessler's uh, uh, articles in uh, Wall Street Journal because um, he had one about uh, two weeks ago about I'm a contrarian and people think that's people that are negative. It's actually people that once they see things gaining popularity, start to ask the tough questions. And I'm, I'm terribly um, uh, summarizing that. But uh, if you think about it, the greatest times to make money, if you look at when innovation happens, usually it happens towards constrained capital, recessions, depressions. Mm. You know, we see it over and over and you think we'd actually face into the storm and go do what Buffett does. Um, and yet we don't. If you look at the 08 recession that affected real estate, some of the smartest money went headlong in the real estate and, and you know, got a lot richer. Um, so I haven't answered that. I have decided that other people manage my money because I'm good at betting on myself and my companies. And that's where I've created my wealth. I just don't think I have the skill set to be out there as a as a good contrarian for my own money. Um, so it's hard when you raise the money because if you know product A gets hot and venture capital or PE lost out on that deal, they'll 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 chase B, C, D, and E until F, you know, goofs it up. And uh, and to me, that's always been an interesting thing. And it's super. I mean, I was in aesthetics since '05, and there were times when I was talking to a group of white males middle age and they're like is this even a thing and at this point now in 2022 it's one of the hottest sectors in the category and everybody wants in um what changed investor appetite changed because there's been money made in it so if you're an entrepreneur you know somebody told me the other day that um you know timing and sentiment in the category is as responsible for your returns as maybe how well you've executed the business and I can see on your nonverbal, you, you, you've been there, right? Mm. It just timing can be interesting. Well, I mean, it's not, yeah, I mean, I, I'm agreeing because <clears throat> timing is, is essential. Like, I mean, Bill Gross, I don't know if you know him. So he did, so he's built multiple unicorns, right? Probably like yeah. you could say of all like the really great found Branson, Musk, yeah. then there's Bill Gross. Um, and he actually looked at all the startups he founded, those that won, and those that he, that he lost, and then other found uh, you know other startups, dot com bubble stuff, Supervan, you know, um, and many many others. And he said, look, we always talk about business models. We talk about cash. We talk about execution. We talk about team. We talk about clearly defined markets and all this kind of stuff. And he said the number one thing actually that is true, but that we don't know is actually about timing. And he was saying if you're too early, you can't get scale. Like Netflix ten years ago, probably not. Um, but now you can because there's massive broadband penetration and access and things like that. But equally, let's just say someone comes into the embrace category, you're too late. You see what I'm saying? Yep. So it's like uh, timing is so, so, so important in, yeah. this, uh, in this idea of like not only getting returns for, for your investors, but also to get to make the greatest difference to the people that you care about. Yeah, it's super weird. I mean, but, you know, look, a, a lot of investors went to very good schools and then got very good MBAs and are very smart. That's tough. You got to go to IC and say, hey, I think this doesn't matter what we bet on. Dental's the thing now, right? There's not a lot of cohort analysis. It's hard to go find data points. And what's interesting is so many times when I see people doing diligence on companies that I'm raising money for or running, they're looking backwards and it's super weird because the only thing you can do is hope to get predictability in what the future looks like. Most of your listeners will know that, you know, your first pitch deck, you're just making up an idea. You're making up a revenue plan. You have no idea how you're going to get there. So I think, you know, honest, honest investors that have been around for a while, I mean, look at private equity. If you started in 08, you were a genius. I mean, I have, you, have, you, you would have to work really hard not to have just crushed it. If you're in private equity from 08 to 2022, we'll see in a higher rate environment where money's not free and multiples aren't going up. Is everybody a genius? So, you know, I think um, I've been I've been on the good side and the bad side of some of the trends. And the same investor told me um, I've invested in companies where they absolutely crushed it and didn't get rewarded. And I've invested in companies that eh, and they got they 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 were rewarded. And so. You know, I'm not sure anybody figures that out um, pretty, pretty sharp. But that's why I think, you know, I'm not a Warren Buffett investor, but I totally, every time I read it, I'm like, of course, that makes sense. Trains aren't going away. So when trains are down, buy the train sets. 
Um, but for whatever reason, I'm just too dumb to <laughs> see those patterns. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, imagine, but the thing is, it's interesting. I spoke to a, a network scientist uh, and he basically, you know, literally studies the future and he basically believes that as humans, we're actually able to see the future. We can anticipate a train crash or a car crash before it happens. So we have wow. this inna in, innate, I mean, it's right. You can see like, you. it's like I got two young kids um, and you know, when they're running around, you know something's going to happen. You know, you know what I'm saying. Like you could, it's just like a thing. Like you can see the car crash coming. You can see the fall and the tears. <laughs> um, and so, because we have this innate idea of, of seeing the future, we're able to change it. So it's the it's the it's the nanoseconds in our mind where we're able yeah. to intuitively figure out, hey, there's actually a gap here. You know, there's an yeah. opportunity here. Yeah, we work on a methodology um, called Breakthrough Outcomes that I've, I've incorporated in my last couple of companies. And this won't be anything crazy, but when you practice it, it is crazy. You know, if you think about people in companies or even opposing, a lot of times we talk about all the abouts, right? Oh, it's about this, it's about that. And so often we don't get to solutions on what, we, what are we for. And one way to focus teams with all different functions and personalities and, and stuff going on during their daily lives is to set what they call a breakthrough outcome. And it has to be relatively near term and it's not um, impossible, but it's highly improbable. And my last several companies uh, where we've done that and it needs to be actionable and measurable. Mm -hmm. So it is very similar to like by the end of this decade, we're going to put a man on the moon. You know, Kennedy didn't know what he was talking about. We needed something to mobilize and, 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 and set the space exploration on, on its course. And so breakthrough outcomes is a methodology we're using at embrace right now. Um, and it sounds crazy to everybody else, but you know, if you've ever watched that first follower video, it's great. You know, you got to find your first follower when you're the crazy. And once they start dancing, a couple people will join. By the time you know it, you've got Woodstock on your hands. So I, I think um, I think that breakthrough outcome is incredibly important. And um, and that's why, you know, I, it's um, how do they say Andy Kessel that same thing said about the truth is like first it's uh, you know like vehemently opposed to right mm. uh, or it's impossible then it's vehemently opposed and then it's true and so I, I think looking at those kind of arcs is really interesting i mean look at evs i mean musk started that no six told everybody he was going to do through the master plan you know now i think tesla still is worth more than all the car companies rolled up um, but look at all of the commercials now all the evs are super cool the trucks are even cool mm. i mean trucks were supposed to go away 10 years ago now the EV trucks have a thousand battery life, more storage, and they're super cool looking and fast. So I don't think you say two years before the great recession, I'm going to start a car company and change every other car company. Mm. That's what happened. Yeah. Well, Rivian did that anyway, didn't they? Like with, uh, with their, I mean, I think they had produced like a hundred cars, like a yeah. hundred, like nothing, yeah. like zero. And That's they were, they were valued at 200 billion. It's crazy. You know, I think there's good look, there's gonna be a lot and there already are going out of business, but you know, there's no question EV is the future. When, when, right? And are there things that displace it? Um, I was early, saw Netflix super early because one of my colleagues left and went there in 06. Uh, I was actually fortunate to meet Reed for a few minutes. And I um, mean, think about that. That was just so you didn't have to get in your car and it's snowy and dress and go to Blockbuster to get the new release that had a sticky carton that it was gone. Mm -hmm. So you didn't, and then that was to the US Postal Service. And when streaming came along, which was only 10 years ago, that stock was cut in half because people thought Netflix was crazy. I mean, can you imagine having to wait for a DVD? Does anybody have a DVD anymore? It's only 10 years ago. The iPhone just turned 15 years. You know, when that came out, people were criticizing jobs for pricing too high. It's like, this isn't a phone. This is an extension of the human brain. I recently had a company. I took all the phones away from the sales reps for 20 minutes. You could feel the bodies shaking. Like their phones are their brains now. So those are crazy, but if you'd said 15, they're only 15 to 10 years ago, nobody believes me when I say, how old do you think the iPhone is? They just assume it's been around since like 1950. You can't imagine living without it. Yeah, I've got a funny story for you. So, you know, we put a man on the moon in 1969. We only put wheels on bags three years later. That's super funny. I, I'm going to, do you mind if I steal that one? I'll give you credit two or three times. No, but after that. Don't, don't worry about it. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, like that's uh, your thing around like the breakthrough. 
yeah. like that breakthrough goal, like the breakthrough thing. Like it just shows you actually how powerful that is. Because if you, I mean, Kennedy was like, yeah, man, we're going to put a man on the moon. And people were like, what? Crazy, never going to happen. And yeah. then we did it and then it became self-evident. And we did all of that, all of that, like remark, like, you know, on the journey of like multi-planetary species for the first yeah. time, we took a step in the right direction yeah. and it's we crazy. were, dr and we were dragging bags on the floor at airports. Crazy. Right? But you probably know this when your, your, your listeners can search it, but wasn't a wheel adopted from the clay, um, spinning the clay and molding clay pots and somehow somebody finally, so it was around for like a thousand years and finally somebody turned it and said, wow. And roll it. Yeah. No, yeah. Oh shit. Like that could work. <laughs> and I'm by the way, like I still think the wheel's like the best invention ever. It is. Think yeah. about it. Like what other simple thing has made such a difference to so many things? Oh, look, we often say a bicycle is the greatest medical device ever invented, right? Get on a bike. It's not bad for your joints, exercise, yeah. all that kind of stuff. It's, um, it's super fun. You know, the, the big and small, I mean, I always joke with people. I, I have a, um, a car and it's the, the title is Tycon Turbo S. And my son said, dad, he's 18, he's super smart. He says, dad, you know, first of all, there's no such thing as horsepower anymore because you know, we had to identify cars and combustible engine by horsepower because you couldn't describe what an engine was. And I always use that, um, you know, how, how powerful is it? It's four horses, four horses pull it that much. And if you think about like a Turbo S on an EV, there's no turbo. I don't know why it's an S. Um, but it's because that car company has had turbo S's in their lineup forever. Um, but, you know, the human brain, I think, always has to have something to anchor to while you're taking them out to the future or it's not believable. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that's the trick for entrepreneurs um, and people a heck of a lot smarter than I am. But it's uh, it's why I think when you get to the end of that journey, you know, and everybody's slapping you on the back about how well you did. You, you just had a lot of miserable meetings and conversations and evenings mm -hmm. of doubt. Yeah. Uh, because it's um, if it's worthy, nobody else believes you. They start believing you the closer you get to success. Mm -hmm. well, <clears throat> just to add to that, I think like everything is the way that it is is because someone changed the way that it was. And that person is usually an entrepreneur. It's the lonely visionary yeah. that suffers every day. I mean, I spoke to a founder yesterday. I speak to them every day. It's my day job. <laughs> it's not yeah. even a job. It's awesome. I get to yeah. meet people like Clint Cornell. Um, and uh, he was saying to me like, I have more bad days than good days. Interesting. Isn't that interesting? And like, who chooses that? Yeah. If you, go to, if, you go to, if you stop like the average person in the street or if you go to your neighbor and you go, yo, I got a thing for you. It's just a new opportunity. But I can promise you this. You're going to have more bad days than good days. Are you in? Yeah. Who's going to do that? Super funny. But you know, it, it's an important point, I think, as you're recruiting people, Matt, because um, – you know, I've started, I think I'm on my sixth or seventh now, and I'm always, my, I, my trigger is when people start going, well, we can't get them because they want, they make this mm. or their other job is bigger. And I'm, I think I'm a pretty good re recruiter. And I, the amount of people I've hired that have never seen the office, um, never really tested the product and don't know what they're going to get paid because I don't sign them up for the wallet part. I sign them up for the heart part. And I think if you find those people, you have to understand what turns them on. Um, you have to give them a higher purpose than themselves. And I, I read recently that or Tim Cook has like four words that you need if you're going to work at Apple, if you saw that. He's like collaboration, yes. You have to have a higher purpose in what you do. You have to be uh, creative. And then you have to have a functional skill that we need. And um, I thought that was super interesting, right, for Apple. And um, so many times we're like, hey, that guy's a great fill in the blank. Or that woman's an amazing because of all her, her past. And I think you really need to make sure that you're signing people up that have bad days. Because if you're in a startup or even a smaller company, you know, who's taking out the trash? Moi. And, um, you know, I keep going big, scaling them up. So I'm, and then I go back and start them. And to me, that's not big or small. It's what's the idea and what do you enjoy doing every day? Um, so, you know, raising capital. Why does anybody want to raise capital? It's the dumbest thing to do for a living. And every time I do it, I'm like, man, I'm never doing this again. And some reason I like going, finding an idea, finding some people and signing them up with some capital. And, you know, we've had, had a fair amount of wins and those are more fun. I just can't imagine the National Lamas run the big division when I was 35 years old and they said, you can be CEO. I said, when they said, maybe like when you're 50 and I thought, oh my God, I'm dead by then. That's such an old guy. 
Um, but also it was the budget meetings and the monotonous attention to PowerPoints and grammar and fonts and HR meetings and forecast. I mean, I was like, oh my God, my, my life is meetings. I don't know what I'm doing. So for me, that wasn't the route. Um, and I'm always suspect when people say, well, did you know they were the president of a 10,000? I'm like, that means they were a super good politician. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's so funny, man. Like um, I, uh, I just sold my, my, one of my companies six months ago to an Australian recruitment firm. It was a data intelligence platform. So it was pure product, just IP sale built from, from line code one, right? Wow. To sale was 18 months. Holy cow. It was super fast. Super fast. Then on the other side, I had a services business, 55 people hated it. Yeah. Top business. Oh my God. Like things get pretty sucky when you start scaling. And it, if it's people intensive, it's like yeah. if you have 50 people, like you should be, you know, doing like ideally 50, 100 million a year. Like that's yeah. the goal, right? Like a big business, but a small team. And so I learned that and I, it's called the new rule like I have for myself. It's like, if I can't have the whole company around my house for lunch, it's too many yeah. people. Ah, that's awesome. You know, it's, it's funny because I um, the team knew when I was at Hydra Facial, they said, what's your next venture? I said, Clint Carnell Inc., where there's one employee. And, <laughs> and, and of course, I listened to that advice for about six months. And now I've got, you know, three that I'm involved in. Um, there's more people, but I agree with you when you can look at those asset light businesses, you know, it's fun. And also what you're good at. I mean, I wish I, I had coding skills or was an engineer or a scientist. That's not my thing. I'm, I'm good at the idea and finding the right people and, and leading them. Um, but there's, you know, you, every executive team I built the team on IQ far exceeds mine. Like I'm always the dumbest person at the table. My only superpower is hiring super smart people. And, uh, and so mine end up being people businesses. So maybe I can take a, a page from your playbook and try to find that Clint Inc company. Yeah, I know exactly. Isn't that the dream, right? Yeah. Like multiple businesses doing like 5 million a year and it's just you like, yeah. that would be, <laughs> like that's, that's the dream, right? Like yeah. you can have your $500 million unicorn, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so two more questions, Clint, and then we'll wrap yeah. up sure. one. Um, so I want to have a bit of fun. So I want to give you the keys to the Matt Brown show time machine, right? Yeah. And uh, I'd like you to cast your mind back to day one of Embrace and think about all the challenges that you've had, all the things that you've learned and so on and so forth. What's the one piece of advice if you could go, if you could go back in time to yourself and give yourself advice, what would that piece of advice be about wow. build, building Embrace? That is great. I will, I will not just say Embrace, but I think almost any successful startup that gets to scale is higher taller you know so many times we constrain ourselves and hire inferior talent um, because that's what we can afford and that's super counterintuitive um, because if you if you have a big vision you're purposeful and you know how to sell the right people you should always hire taller than you need um, because the old saying that, uh, you know, don't hang around their necks, stand on their shoulders. And I think mm. the stakes that I've made have almost inevitably been, um, you know, higher and higher and shorter, uh, than I needed, because if you've got big plans and big visions, you don't want to outpace those people. You want those people building the scaffolding or the tracks ahead of needing it. Mm. Um, so, and that's cross technology, sales, marketing, HR, finance. Um, the second thing is make sure you're not hiring resumes. You know, if you look most of the, I mean, how many times do we need to see the story? I dropped out of Stanford, I dropped out of Harvard, and now I'm a trillionaire. I mean, come on, it, it can't be that higher education, an MBA, a PhD, you know, a subspecialty, and a 30 year career at Johnson & Johnson is what the ingredients are. Um, experience is nice, you get to see the, you, the pitches a lot, so human beings can start to see the future, but I like hanging out with young people, um, particularly this crew, the younger millennials, Generation Z, they don't respect authority. And it's super fun because you get like fastballs. So, you know, I think the people piece is super important in any startup. And time machine, I wish I worried less about raising the capital, the specifics on the PowerPoint, the fonts, the branding, all that. Like great people just crush it for you. So hire as tall as you can. Would you say, just for my information, would you say that you've had most of your success in just this last 10 years? So from like 43 to 53, would you say? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think there's this myth that, you know, young people start companies. You need some, I think it helps to have experience. You know, unfortunately I started my first one at 29, the IPO in 06. 
first real CEO job at 40. And, and then the last, you know, 12 years have been firmly the CEOs starting them or running them or taking them public. But yeah, I think the last 10 years has probably been the, the most solid. Um, when people are like, you're going to retire now, I mean, you've made plenty of money. I'm like, retire. What do you what, do? What is that? I'm already a crappy golfer, right? I'm not sure I'll ever get below a 10 handicap. Um, I mean, I, I look at it, I'm like, you know, I'm going to probably fall over in the rocking chair you know, penciling on a napkin, my, my next, my next company. Isn't it funny? Like some, another entrepreneur friend of mine, he actually found some stats somewhere, some think tank. They were like, when is an entrepreneur successful? Like how old are they? Um, and, uh, and it's actually mid fifties, mid fifties. Yeah. Wow. Then obviously there's, there's, it's, there's people get it earlier and later, what have you. Uh, but most of the time, it's actually after 50. And it's because you have to have all these failures. You know what I mean? You have to learn about people. You have to learn about that breakthrough yeah. idea, you know, and so on and so forth, so that you can get the skill set to actually figure out what you're about, how much is enough, and how to get there. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I find as entrepreneurs, like, I'm, like I was beating myself up the other day. Or no, I was talking to, like, a, another founder, and he was like, yeah, uh, oh, it's a, a Howard Mann great guy um and he's a business turnaround specialist so he was saying like entrepreneurs in their f like mid 40s it's like it's do or die because if you haven't made it like if you don't have a high net worth like now the chips are on the on the on the cards right and to your point oh, yeah. yeah man and like to your point it's like it becomes it takes 15 years to become an overnight success um so but i think that the reality the point i'm trying to get across is it's like you don't actually need it like beat yourself up because you're okay. 43 like there's so many 30 30 somethings that feel like they're old and they don't have enough time to, yeah. to do these sorts of things it's super weird i mean I, you know in some ways i wish i'd started you know 10 years earlier right out of university right at 22 um but it is weird i, I do see that factor um more in, and this sounds a little sexy more men than women but you're right that mid 40s you're hiring an executive and they haven't made it and they start making demands about their pay and guarantees. And I've had more than on one occasion, like, are you sure you're in? Um, I know it's scary, but if you want to make a lot of money, stop worrying about it so much um, because you can't do this for the money. The money will come in, in, in ridiculous amounts if you're super successful, um, but you, you, you can't reverse engineer that. I got to have a guarantee and make money because I haven't made it, but I want to be super famous. It just yeah. doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. um, I don't care if you're an athlete, if you're a world-class orthopedic surgeon or an entrepreneur, like there's just no shortcuts. Yeah, and, exactly. And, uh, the people, you know, if, you, if you're going to ski through the trees fast, don't look at the trees, look at the path. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that means you can't be worried about all the traditional trappings. What's my salary? Is there a 401k match? What's my benefits? Is that a good insurance plan? Like, what are you talking about? You got to get out of my office because you're not ready for this. Go work for Johnson Johnson which is a wonderful company. Um, and, um, and that's okay. I don't judge those people, but I can't have those people in companies that are trying to change the world because those are not, um, those are not aligned values. Yeah, agree. Uh, and that's a really important point for everyone. Uh, Clint, um, let's, uh, let's wrap this up. Uh, one more thing, one more question for you. Why do you do what you do? Like what gets you out of bed in the morning? A builder. You know, I just can't unsee it when I see an opportunity and, you know, I try to wave it off and, um, and I just can't, can't unsee it. Like once you see something that, you know, you can create and contribute your time and talent to, uh, if you think you can put other people behind it, it's super addictive. Um, and so to me, I'm a builder, um, you know, look, there's plenty of room for companies once they're dying and you get a CFO type in and they start milking it for cash and they financially engineer it and maybe the stock price goes up. I can do those things. Um, it does not turn me on. I get my energy from white space, from doing things that, that other people can't do. And it's super fun. There's got to be some ego in it. And I've been part of building fun brands and, and having some successful exits. Uh, but I'm always surprised when I get a plaque for something that I won. I know entrepreneurs and CEOs that have whole PR firms following them around on Instagram, you know, applying for all these awards, sitting on all these panels. I could give to whatever's about that. Um, but building stuff, that to me is super, super fun. And it's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Amazing. Clint, uh, amazing conversation, amazing show. Thank you for being here. Super excited to see where, uh, you know, you, not only with Embrace, but like, you know, where you might go in the future. I think uh, if you're building things that matter to the world, 
um, you know, you're one of the unique ones. So thank you for being here. Thanks, Matt. And according to you, I'm just starting to hit my stride. I've got three years left until I get to that middle 55. <laughs> 55. <laughs> Thanks, Fair Matt. Enough. I really appreciate it. Cheers, bud. Thank you, guys. Cheers, cheers.